In this video, we are going to develop a parallel LU decomposition algorithm, starting from a sequential algorithm. The main question we have to answer when we design a parallel algorithm is what, is, what are the data distributions or distribution that we are going to use? If we decide on a data distribution uh, and we have a sequential algorithm, then the work distribution will follow automatically uh, and these are the computation super steps. All information may not be available at the pro processor where you want it, so that means that you will need to insert communication super steps and we do this by following the need to know principle. And this means that we design the algorithm backwards starting from computation super steps, inserting communication super steps. The bulk of the computations is the update of a matrix element. The matrix element AIJ, we subtract from it an element AIK times AKJ. And we do this for all matrix elements IJ larger than K. So this has a total of 2 times n minus k minus 1 squared flops. Uh, so this is the main part of the work. All the elements of such a statement may not be on the same processor. Aij, Aik and Akj may be on different processors. Now, my question to you, who does the update? Which processor does the update? You may have pondered the answer. And, uh, well, there are two types of elements. The matrix element AIJ that must be updated. There are many such elements. On the other hand, the element AIK and AKJ that we use, they are all from either row K or column K. So there are only few of those. So our decision is to let the owner of AIJ compute the update. That way we do not need to communicate the owner. And to bring in the others, AIK and AKJ, we obtain by communication. Here you see this in a, in a matrix. We have computed uh, L and U. Uh, AIK may be on the red processor, AKJ on the blue processor, and AIJ is the processor that needs these two elements, and uh, that's on the yellow processor. So now if we decide to distribute a row I over N processors, N being probably less than p, the total number of processors, then we limit communication because AIK only needs to be sent to processors that have something in row, row i in this case. Uh, and that is, uh, that is very useful. Now we're going to decide on a data distribution and we'll introduce a few formal definitions. So what is a matrix distribution? It's a mapping. A mapping phi from the set of elements of the matrix, the elements i, j, rho i, column j, uh, to the set of processors. And sometimes we number the processors in a one-dimensional fashion from 0 to p minus 1. But here, since we're talking about matrices and they are two-dimensional, we also number the processors in a two-dimensional fashion with uh, m numbers s and n numbers t and then we have that m times n equals p, the total number of processors. So it's just a two-dimensional numbering and then the mapping function phi has two coordinates. So the phi of element ij is a pair phi zero i, phi zero of i j, phi one of i j. So a processor row p s 
uh, star is a group of processors that all have the same first coordinate s. So it's the PST with t between 0 and n, and we also can similarly define a processor column. Matrix distributions can be arbitrary, but if there's a special set of matrix distributions which we call Cartesian. Uh, the name comes from Cartesian product of rows and columns. So what does it mean? If phi i j is a function of, in the first coordinate only of the row number i, and in the second coordinate only of the of the column number j, then we have a special distribution because row i decides the processor row and column j, column j of the matrix, decides the processor column. So this is an, and an example you see above. You see that we have uh, uh, two processor rows, 0 and 1. We have three processor columns, 0, 1 and 2. And here you see the, um, the elements that are assigned to a processor. For example, uh, on the top left you see processor 0, 0. It gets, it's in processor row 0 and processor column 0, and that means that it get, becomes light yellow. The dark yellow one will then be 1, 0. If we have a Cartesian distribution, then we can use this to formulate our algorithm. Thinking of the sequential algorithm, where we just divided all the elements of column k, all the elements a, i, k, by the diagonal element, we recognize that here in the second super step. So we do for all the i between k and n, which are mine, I do this division. And how do I express which are mine? Well, element a, i, k is in processor with the first coordinate phi 0 i equals s, and the second coordinate must be phi 1 k equals t, and I am processor s t. That's the program text, as we have seen, we write in single program multiple data style, so we write the program text for a single processor, and that processor is processor s t. So we only need to do the divisions for the elements that we possess. On the other hand, I'm dividing by AKK. It may not be in my possession, so I have to retrieve that. And that's how we design an algorithm backwards, because the first super step that we then insert put, puts AKK in all the processors that need it. And uh, that's actually all the processors in the same processor column. So that's where you write p star comma t. And when do we do this? Only if this element akk is mine. So phi, k, phi 0 k must equal s and phi 1 k must equal t. So this may need a moment to absorb, but this is how we express the algorithm for a general Cartesian distribution. We can do something similar for the remainder of the algorithm, and then we look at the second super step. You recognize the matrix updates, and we perform them for all i and j, but of course only if they are mine. And that's why we have a statement, uh, a condition, phi 0 i should be s, and phi 1 j should be t. How can we perform this, this update? Well, we can only perform it if we have obtained first the elements a, i, k and a, k, j. So if we look at the statement at the top, then you see that we put a, i, k in all the elements in the, of the processor row. And we do that for all the elements that are mine and we do something similar in, this, in the second part of that super step it, uh, for, the, for the elements of a, of a row. 
So we follow the need to know principle. We, we communicate exactly those non-local data that are needed in a following computation super step. We also want to analyze the cost of the algorithm in order to understand the time it will take, but also to see if it is an efficient algorithm. And for this, we introduce, uh, we introduce another term, RK. This is the maximum number of local matrix rows with an index larger than or equal to K. This tells you something about how many matrix elements you have to update. Uh, if we are in stage K, we have to update all elements larger than K, meaning larger than or equal to K plus one. And for all those elements, uh, we, uh, we have to do that for the elements in my row and my column. So we have the processor that has most rows, has RK plus one rows, and the process, and if it has most columns, then it has CK plus one columns. And since we have to perform two flops for every matrix element, the computation of this stage K costs two times RK plus one times CK plus one. And we can then reason with this. Here is an example. At the start of the algorithm, if we want to compute just what R0 is, then we look at the processor rows and we see that processor row 0 has four rows. Those are the ones in this case that are uh, with uh, the 0, 0 in the elements, or 0, 1, or 0, 2. So R0 equals 4. On the other hand, if we look at the columns, we see that processor uh, column uh, zero has three columns, matrix columns, and the others have less. So C zero equals three. So this way we can, uh, can find exactly how many flops we have to perform. Now a cyclic distribution, which we have seen already for vectors, but a cyclic distribution we can also use for the matrices, then, uh, then has a very good, uh, a very good uh, cost, a very low cost, because Rk is, um, equals n minus k divided by m rounded up. This is the minimal cost, because if we have all the elements, all the rows from k to n, including k, those are n minus k rows, and we, if we divide them evenly, then everybody gets n minus k divided by m, and we sometimes need to round up. So an advantage of the cyclic distribution, also in the matrix case, is that we will get the minimum rk and the minimum ck. So that's why we want to use that as a data distribution. So not only Cartesian, but also cyclic. Here you see a dis distribution, which is a block distribution, not a cyclic distribution. Uh, and you see that during the algorithm, the part of the matrix that, that is active becomes smaller. Here we are halfway, and you see that halfway, only the yellow processor is still working. At the start, all processors worked, but from k equals 4 onwards, only one processor is active. And that's not very good for, uh, for load balance. On the other hand, if we use the cyclic distribution, you see that halfway, still all processors are in the game. So we they all still work. And only at the last step for k equals 7, the yellow, only one processor is working, the yellow one. We can analyze the cost then, uh, and the cost of the computation super step, which does the update, then is equal to two times the number of flops that we get, the number of rows at most. This is RK plus one times CK plus one. Uh, and if we, um, if we round that, then we see that this number is larger than or 
equal to 2 times n minus k minus 1 squared divided by p. The p comes from m times n. So that's a lower bound on the cost. But we also have an upper bound. That's if we round upwards, then we add at most 1. So and if we simplify that, we get a formula which contains a term m plus n. And if and now we, we have the freedom to choose m and n to minimize this. Of course, under the constraint that m times n equals p. So it's best in this case to choose m and n to be equal, and then they become equal to square root p. So we get a square distribution, and that's good because it minimizes this upper bound on the computation time, and that way we also in some way minimize the computation time. We can also look at what happens to the communication time. Remember that we had rk plus 1 rows, and for every row we had to send one element to all the other processors, to n minus 1 processors. So that's why we get a term rk plus 1 times n minus 1, and a similar term for, for, the, uh, for the C times g, that's the communication time per data word. And we can again substitute this. Uh, we can round the ceiling up by saying, OK, it is at most uh, n minus k minus 1 divided by n plus 1 times n. And we simplify that. And then we see an expression n plus n uh, in the last line, which can be minimized by taking m and n to be equal, but also the expression n divided by m plus m divided by n. If you do some calculus, you see that taking them equal, n and m, also minimizes that term. So we are happy in this case because communication is minimized also in the case of a square distribution. So what did we do? Looking back at the design of our algorithm. We first uh, chose a data distribution. We chose it Cartesian to limit the communication. And then we saw that by choosing it to be 2D cyclic, we further limited communication and also took care that the load balance is better. Then for cyclic distribution, we found out that a square distribution is the best, so square root p times square root p distribution. Well, we have a correct algorithm now, and we've analyzed the BSP cost. Question is, can it still be improved? Can we try harder? We'll see that next time. A final question to you. Here you see a matrix. It's an 8 by 8 matrix with a 2 by 2 cyclic distribution. You should determine the total time expressed in flops of the matrix updates of the LDU decomposition.